Hey guys, so in today's video I'm going to teach you all about soldering. I'll show you the types of soldering tools that I use, what makes a good solder joint, what makes a bad one, and how to fix it, as well as some other tips related to amp repair and building that I've learned along the way. So why are good solder joints so important? They ensure a strong electrical connection between components. A bad joint could cause component leads to break, it could cause signal cutout, popping and crackling, and other symptoms like that. So let's get started. So I use a Weller WES-51 soldering station. It's nice because you have control over the temperature, although it usually is turned all the way up. And then with that I use the soldering pencil, it's the Weller PES-51. And uh, it's important to have a sponge to keep the soldering iron clean. The solder spool that I have right now is a Kester 44 rosin core solder. Gets the job done just fine for me. And the last important soldering tool is a solder sucker. I'll show you how it works later, but basically it's used to suck out old solder. All right, so now I will show you how to make a good solder joint. So the key is to heat up the component first, and then you feed the solder into it once it's hot enough. And then you let that cool, and we'll evaluate it. We can see it's going to need a little bit more solder. It's not completely filled in. All right, so we can see this is nice and shiny. Go to the other side and it's flowed through nicely. There's not too much, but it's filled in all the way. And I'll show you again on the other side of this resistor. So remember to heat up the component lead first and then flow the solder through by touching that hot component lead. and then let it cool before you move it. This could use a little bit more. All right, it's got that nice glossy shine. And then once you're done soldering, it's always a good idea to just clean off the iron. Now I'll show you how to desolder, and you'll do this if you're changing a component. Um, so the way you do it is you heat up the solder joint and then take the solder sucker and just uh, suck it right out. And we do that maybe another time. So you can see that most of the solder has been sucked out of there. And you just keep doing that until you're able to free the component. All right, so again, this right here is a nice solder joint. You can see that glossy shine and the solder goes up and over the component lead. But again, there's not too much. And then this is not so good. Um, you can see it's kind of caving in and it's not covering the entire component lead, so this could easily break loose over time. You never want to apply too much solder. Always be aware of how much you're feeding through, because if you feed too much, it'll bleed through the other side. Um, the solder could drip and short another component or become loose in the chassis, so always be aware of how much you're feeding through. Another tip I have is when you're soldering, be aware of any wires or components in the general vicinity because you don't want to accidentally knock one with your iron and burn the wire or component. And to maximize the life expectancy of your iron and the tip, just turn off the station when you're not using it. I generally have to replace my iron like once a year maybe and the tip I have to replace every couple of months or so. So now I'm going to show you how to replace a component. I'm going to replace this 100k resistor right here. 
And something I've learned, instead of trying to suck all the solder out with the component in, I'm going to first take my wire cutters and clip off the leads like that. Just clip it out. And now on the other side of the board, where the component resided, which is right here, we're going to take our needle nose pliers and our soldering iron. We're going to heat up and remove the leftover lead from that resistor. All right, so now we have those leads removed and we can just suck out the rest of the solder. And you wanna do this quickly, especially on a PCB because you can damage a trace if you apply too much heat to it. Okay, so we now have two open holes right here where the component was and we can install the new resistor. So here I have the new resistor that's going in and I've folded down the leads so that they will fit in the holes. And then we'll fold these over a little bit just so it doesn't fall out when we're soldering. Let's solder that baby in there. And again, you don't want to let your iron linger too long so it doesn't overheat. And then we'll just clip off the excess leads. And there you have it. The resistor is installed. Let's say you're soldering a component and you let that iron linger for a little too long. Well, now you can see we have damaged the trace. and uh, this component is no longer making contact with the trace that it's connected to, which is not good, but there is a way to fix it if you accidentally do this. All you would have to do is follow the trace visually or by checking the schematic, and you can see that this component is supposed to connect over here to this guy. And see that trace. So all you'd have to do is connect a wire from here to here and just hardwire it that way. It's not ideal, but it happens to the best of us and sometimes, you know, you just gotta do what you gotta do. So now let's focus our attention to this area right here. Um, the connection obviously looks good right now, but another instance would be if the trace is damaged. Something that you could do is take a small flathead screwdriver or an X-Acto knife and just scrape the trace until you can see the copper. And then take your iron and just connect them like that. So now that trace is reinforced. Again, not ideal. It works well in some applications, but for instance, a pedal with traces so thin as this, it's probably more reliable to just run a wire. Okay, so let's say we're soldering in this area right here. You can see visually there's no trace between these two joints. So these two components, as far as we know, are not supposed to be connected. Um, but let's just say we are soldering and we're a little careless and accidentally solder a little bit too much and bridge those two components together. So now these components are connected when they shouldn't be, and you definitely want to avoid this because it could cause damage to your amp depending on which components are soldered together. So always be aware of what's around you. And one more tip, if you're trying to unsolder a connection and you're having a hard time getting some of the solder out, a good tip is to apply some new solder and then try sucking it out. And yeah, we can see that took all the solder out nice and clean. Another request you guys had is soldering to pots for ground connections. Obviously in this pedal application, it's not required, but if you're building an amp and you need to ground a component on the pot, 
this is the way to do it. So you can take again a small flat head or an X-Acto knife. And what you want to do is scrape the back of the pot in a crisscross pattern. And this is to give something for the solder to stick to, because if you try to just solder onto the smooth back of the pot, it's not going to stick very well. So now we heat up the pot where we scraped it and then start applying the solder. Sometimes it takes a couple tries. And then you let it cool. And then just make sure that it's on there nice and tight. So a lot of you guys had also asked me about soldering to the chassis for some ground connections. In a lot of old fenders, the filter can cap is grounded to the chassis. The amps or the cathode of the power tubes are grounded, are soldered to the chassis, as well as some other ground connections. And I don't recommend doing this. It's hard to get the iron hot enough to get a solid, solid connection to the chassis. You want both a solder and a mechanical connection to enforce a really strong ground. So I recommend, for example, with the can capacitor, just run one of the ground tabs to a secure ground. These are the types of connectors that I use for ground connections. Um, these holes here are where the screw would go into the chassis which provides the mechanical connection. And then these little holes here and inside here are where you would solder the wire component for the solder connection. So using connectors ensures, again, a super solid ground because you do not want these to break. And if you were to solder to the chassis today, it's probable that you would have some issues in the future. So one more note on my anti-soldering to the chassis for ground stance. Um, at the shop I work at, Revamp, we've learned that um, when replacing the can caps on old Champs and Princetons and the like, the caps can fail if uh, we try to solder the grounds to the chassis because when you're applying so much heat to those tabs, trying to get the solder to stick to the chassis, it can cause failure. So again, I don't recommend that. So that about does it for my soldering video. Hope you guys have gotten something out of it. And if I miss something, please let me know. I'll try to address it in future videos. I've got some cool repairs coming up that I'm documenting for you guys. So I'm really excited about that. And uh, see you then.